Okay, how does a cow breathe? We're moving on to the third and fourth ways to answer that question. We have four lung volumes. There are four independent. There's no overlap between these. And basically, you're dividing the lung volumes into four separate um, non-overlapping uh, sections. We'll start with the tidal volume or the change in volume of the lungs that's associated with the normal breathing. So as the rib cage moves, as the diaphragm moves up and down, if we're sitting, relaxing, not working too hard, the lungs are going to change a certain amount of volume. That particular volume is known as the tidal volume, how much we normally breathe in and out. Um, in a in a kind of a non-exertion setting. We have the inspiratory reserve volume. How much more air could we breathe in if we wanted to? So this is above and beyond our normal tidal breathing. It comes into play when we start working out, when we start exerting ourselves, getting into aerobic activity. We it, start to take this reserve volume and use it as we move more air in and out to keep up with our need. Expiratory reserve is kind of the other end of that. How much more could we push out if we needed to? So beyond our tidal volume, normal breathing, how much more could I push out? I'm filling up that balloon. I need a little bit extra. What do I need to get that done? Then we have our residual volume. If we bring up the diaphragm as high as it can go, if we collapse the ridges, ribs as much as we can go, we're still going to have volume inside that rib cage. They can only go so flat. We're not rats that can collapse their skeletons and all that stuff. So we can only go down a certain amount. So there's always going to be air in the lungs. It's a question of how much difference is there between our collapsed lung and then our completely open lung, which goes through our expiratory reserve, our tidal volume, and our inspiratory reserve, adding up to our what's called our total lung capacity. Take a look at an adult cow. We're going to stack it up this way, our reserve, residual volume. That's as little as our lungs can get. And that is about six liters, a gallon and a half in a adult cow. Tidal volume, they're going to breathe about, about four liters. About a gallon is going to flow in and out while they're just kind of hanging out, not doing much. As a uh, um, cow gets out springtime, gets running around, they're going to be out of shape. They're going to start using... Our inspiratory reserve, how much more can they get in their lungs? How much more can they exhale? So when they start running, they're going to use this entire, uh, what is that, 16 liters moving air in and out, four gallons in and out. Our lung capacities, these are combinations of our four lung volumes that tell us something about the animal's ability to breathe and what is there. So if you go get your lungs tested, they're going to focus on these capacities. How much can you breathe in? How much can you breathe out? And they're going to figure measure your volumes, and then they're going to add up to generate these capacity. So there's the vital capacity. There's the inspiratory capa capacity. There's the functional reserve capacity and the total lung capacity. So what are these capacities, where do they come from, what do they do? So if we stack up again our four volumes over here, we take each of our capacities and we show that they are a sum of one or two or more uh, volumes. So we start with vital capacity here. Vital capacity is the air we can move in and out of the lungs. So inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, expiratory reserve, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve is the air we can move out. That is the vital capacity. 
if we take a normal breath and then we breathe in as much as we can, we fill up all four of these volumes. That is our total lung capacity. So we have all four volumes making up that particular capacity. If we take total lung capacity and go two and two, we have our FRC is our residual and our expiratory reserve. Our inspiratory capacity is tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve. So four lung capacities, four lung volumes, and we'll show you how we kind of measure those, how we track those in the. So getting back to our lung capacities, our vital capacity is tidal volume plus our two reserves. Inspiratory capacity is our, our um, inhaled normal tidal volume and then inspiratory reserve volume. Our functional residual capacity um, is our expiratory reserve and our residual volume. So these two together, uh, insp uh, inspiratory capacity, functional reserve capacity, eh, we can add those two together and we can get total lung capacity. Total lung capacity is all four volumes added together. So here's some definitions here for your uh, use as you need them. But I think I pretty much covered all those except for this one, but we won't worry about that. So lung capacities, you can think of a number of different ways. I gave you an example for each. When your homework, we're going to ask you to come up with different ways to figure out these different capacities. Starting with total lung capacity minus fractional residual capacity is going to give you inspiratory capacity. Adding things together, subtracting them apart. There are lots of different combinations of volumes and capacities that can give you the various definitions for each of these. So we'll be doing that with the homework. So I posted up on YouTube uh, this uh, tutorial. It's another way of looking at the same thing. I'm going to try to do the same thing as they did in there um, between the two. I hope you can get things uh, clear in your head. So four volumes, four capacities. So this is a diagram here. We have, I don't know what kind of animal is hooked up here. At least I hope it's an animal. I'm going to go with a dog, maybe a Cocker Spaniel. I don't really know. So the dog is going to be probably on a treadmill of some sort, and you're going to have him breathing in and out. You have this particular thing here moves up and down as the cat, the cat, dog, um, breathes. And you have this string here that's going to uh, hold a pen and then a piece of paper that moves. So this is a fairly old diagram. So as this moves up and down, this will move up and down proportional to the volume change in there. So we looked at our four volumes, residual, expiratory, tidal volume, inspiratory. So we have an animal breathing normally. You're going to see that tidal volume change. So they start to inhale, they exhale, they inhale. What somehow they get this animal, I don't know how they do it, to blow out as much as they can. So the expiratory reserve volume is used. We are left in the lungs. The ribs are collapsed as much as they can. Stomach muscles have pushed up the diaphragm as much as it can, and we're down to our residual volume. Then we get that animal to breathe in as much as it can. It's gonna take up as much air into its lungs as we can. We are moving through the vital capacity. These three volumes are now our vital capacity. And then we have the exhalation and we're back to normal tidal volumes. So depending on what was happening, how things happen, that animal 
The change in volume is noted here. So as far down as it can go, what's left in the lungs, residual volume, this is uh, vital capacity, all four together are total lung volume. So numbers up here for the four capacities, putting those through. So again, here's a, another set of how these things might go through. We'll look here sort of how our lung moves up and in and out. So we've got this, we're missing a circle there where our uh, minimum lung volume is. And then we stretch out our lungs to do the other volumes. So basically we're pulling down on the lung, we're making that bubble bigger, and we have a greater lung capacity as we inhale. So we're gonna focus on these diagrams, what's happening. So animal breathing normally in, in, out, in, out. Take a deep breath in as much as we can. Then we let that air go out to our normal level, normal. Inhale, breathe out for all we're worth. We take it down to blowing out the candles as much as we can. We come back to our normal breathing. Again, we're going to push our lungs to breathe in as much as we can. We're going to exhale as much as we can. And that change in air is the most volume we can change. Our lungs go from as big as they can be to as small as they can be. And that's our vital capacity. Again, tidal volume here, inspiratory, expiratory reserve, inspiratory reserve, inspiratory capacity, functional reserve, and then residual volume, total lung capacity. Time passes, air volume in the lungs. So we start down here and we get the line is the amount of volume in the lung at any one time. So air in the lungs. Another diagram here, the thing that sort of shows that's different in this one, again, you're going to do the breathe in, breathe out total. But as we start to exert ourselves, varying levels of activity here, we start to steal our inspiratory reserve. We start to steal our expiratory reserve. And the tidal volume, the change in volume in our lungs increases as we reserve or exert ourselves. So you've got your functional, you got all your capacities here. We're going to ignore this minimum volume here. The residual, residual volume is as low as we can go. So until our lungs disconnect, this is, is always going to be this much air and it's suggesting that 20% of our lungs are always there compared to our full 100%. We're going to have at least one fifth is still there. What we're trying to do is get all the air out of our alveoli and then hopefully this 20% is just our transfer areas, the bronchio, the trachea, all those. So we want to push everything in there and um, and another diagram here showing how the inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve is stolen during times of exertion. And then we get to the point where this is all we can do. And then once we run out of oxygen at this point, no matter how much we're based on what we're doing, we're going to have to stop. Again, total lung capacity, the entire thing. What we can move in and out, which is what we're moving to right here. Vital capacity, inspiratory capacity, functional residual, resting tidal volume, tidal volume during activity are two reserve volumes that we steal as more activity happens. Again, we're going to talk about syringes. Uh, see if you can get one. I'll give you a demo 
here. If you need me to mail you one, email me and let me know. I can send you one so you can work on this from a hands-on perspective. I'll show you in the tutorial how to make one, but if you don't have a syringe, I have pre-made ones for the demo um, in my office. We can get those to you. The last thing we're going to talk about, the fourth thing we're going to talk about is the gas exchange. How does air oxygen get to the tissues? How does carbon dioxide get out? So we're going to talk about the lungs here. And what we have is we're down in the alveolar sacs. We're taking a, a little section here. We're going to zoom in on that. We've got bubbles, the alveoli all around us, little chambers. These elastic, these springy things that are going to bring air in and out, and that's how our oxygen and or where our oxygen and our carbon dioxide are going to be exchanged. So let's highlight some of the anatomy here. If we look at the blue section here on your diagram. This is all about the elasticity that surrounds these alveoli. We want to stretch them out make them big as the lung expands, and then we want to collapse them way down. This elastic tissue that exists between the alveoli, these empty chambers, is what allows that to happen. Now we get into uh, older lungs, damaged lungs, these that is scarred up, this elasticity goes away, we can't move air in and out, and it becomes a challenge. When a healthy lung, this elasticity between the alveoli, we have one here, two here, three here. Um, between those allows that stretching and expansion to draw air in, that negative pressure that's going to move air in. We look at the things outlined in red, and these are the single cells that line or make up the outside of the alveolus. So notice they are kind of pancaked out, just like the cells in the capillaries, and they are very, very thin. We pair that, we've got our capillary cell here. You've got the individual, I guess we got two endothelial cells that make up the outside of the capillary, and this little odd-shaped barbell hourglass in here is in a single red blood cell moving single file on its side through the uh, pulmonary capillaries. So if you're looking at oxygen change, you got this big area here with uh, our gases, the gases that are going in and the gases that are coming out have a very short distance because everything is flat. You have those alveoli that are very intimately connected or placed next to the capillary beds, the network, the net that basically surrounds the entire outside of the alveolus. And we only have, like, it looks like half of a red blood cell, we know how small those are, um, width to travel. So diffusion happens, the thinner things are, the faster the diffusion happens. We need that oxygen to get to the red blood cell, which is right here, and then the carbon dioxide to get out. So thinness helps. We also have our last thing here is our white blood cell. We know that there's a lot of things in the air we breathe. Bring that air inside the lungs, having those red blood cell or white blood cells there to defend our lungs against the problems that are occurring, the biological and non-biological. So we have our macrophage here that's going to engulf things as they come in. So all these things work together, the thinness, the elasticity, the protection from disease to make our lungs work and work properly. Okay, this is a somatic about how um, the oxygen moves into the tissues and how the oxygen or carbon dioxide moves out. And again, everything moves from a high to a low. 
So we start out with oxygen here. We've got a partial pressure of 104. That's out of, uh, I think it's 720, maybe 760 um, atmospheres. Um, the atmospheric pressure totals out to 700, I think 760. And then 20% of that is oxygen. So as we go into the body, it's going to dilute out. But we start out with 100. That oxygen diffuses down its, down its concentration gradient. We go from 100 to 104. So oxygen wants to come in. We start out as we go across the pulmonary capillary at 40. That oxygen wants to go down. It gonna, it's going to fill up to about 100 and then leave the lungs. The lungs, the blood goes through the heart, back to the heart, out to the body capillaries. We no real exchange till we get to the tissue capillaries. We are at 100 here. The tissue is less than or equal to 30. We're going to go down the concentration gradient, diffusing from a high to a low. The oxygen is going to leave the capillaries and move into the tissues. The oxygen is consumed by the tissues, it's destroyed. And in that process, we create CO2 and water, respiration. We have a 50 partial pressure of CO2. We look at the partial pressure of CO2 in the capillary. We start out at 40, we're at 50 here. It's gonna flow down its concentration gradient, gonna leave the tissue at the venous end at 45. So we've increased from 40 to 45, losing that there. We don't have as strong a gradient as we do with the oxygen, but it is enough to remove what we need to. We go back through the uh, vena cava, we go through the heart, we go out to the lungs. CO2 at 45, the lung alveolus is at 40. Again, the going from a high to a low, the carbon dioxide goes down its concentration radiant. And as we get to the other end of the capillary, the carbon dioxide is at 40. So basically, you're starting high up here, lower here, the desire for everything to move this way for oxygen, 50 here, 40 here. Things are going to move out of the body. Everything moves from a high to a low. That's the way. The physics, the universe works. Everything wants to move from a high to a low. Same diagram, again, um, with uh, carbon dioxide from Duke's Physiology. If you're really interested in this stuff, Duke's Physiology is the undergraduate reference book. Uh, the one, um, usually it's a senior level physiology class. We're keeping things a little bit more basic here. So you've got carbon dioxide uh, production in the tissues. It's going to move into the tissue capillaries. It's going to react with the solution, move through the vein, past the heart, get here. The processes will reverse, and carbon dioxide flowing down its concentration radiant will leave through the alveolus. So you're not going to get all of it out, but you're going to get some every time you go through this cycle. So that's our uh, discussion of lungs. We talked about the parts, the mechanics of breathing, the uh, volumes and capacities, and then the air exchange. So those are the four answers to how does uh, we breathe.